we're in this series. We, we're actually still in that series, Eternal Security, believe it or not. Uh, but we end up so many times when we start a series, we run down a rabbit hole uh, in order to explain or define maybe some things that I feel uh, we don't fully understand. Uh, understanding is everything. Uh, in Proverbs 4 and 8, uh, Solomon, in, in the wisdom of God that he had given him, said, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Uh, and wisdom is the application or the correct application of knowledge. It's not the application of knowledge, it's the correct application of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is taking knowledge and using it correctly. And the ultimate purpose of us studying the Word of God and being in the Word of God and God giving us His Word is that we would read and learn what is in it and then we take it and apply it to our everyday life. It's not just something, to, a book end to keep the rest of the books on the shelf upright because it's bigger and thicker and heavier. It's actually meant to be used. And uh, wisdom, the application of the Word or knowledge is by far the greatest thing. So Solomon says, uh, uh, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But he doesn't finish the sentence there. He says, but in all you're getting, or in all you're getting of wisdom that is, get understanding. And, and so knowledge is, is what we get in the book. Wisdom is what we are asked or hoped to apply in our everyday life. But between knowledge and wisdom is understanding. So it's paramount for all of us that we don't just carry a Bible around with us with the expectation or aspiration of it working in our lives, but that in-between item called understanding is absolutely essential because without it, you can't take that knowledge and you can't convert it into wisdom. You just need understanding. So it is vitally important that we take time to explain things, and that's what we do here at Bible Optics. So and we've been doing eternal security um, and we talked about how it's very, very hard to have confidence in something that you're not secure in. And so we took up all of the scriptures concerning being secure in Christ Jesus and how uh, we are sealed by the Spirit of God and how our security in Christ is indeed uh, uh, affirmed and asserted. But we talked then about, well, you know, if you teach that sort of a message, then do Christians just sort of go buck mad and think, well, I'm already secure, my salvation is guaranteed, and I'm going to spend the rest of eternity with God, therefore I can just do whatever I like, and just sin like the dickens. And I said, no, you can't. Uh, the scriptures deal with that too. And so we ended up over in this subsection of a rabbit hole, and we started to talk about two aspects of sin, the unpardonable sin and the sin unto death. We took up the unpardonable sin first, uh, which is blasphemy against the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so let me just ask, who can commit the unpardonable sin? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. Who can't commit the unpardonable sin? Believers. Believers. Believers can't commit it. The unpardonable sin is the rejection of the convicting, convincing work of the Spirit of God in a person's life where he's drawing them to Christ, drawing them to God, and they are refusing or they are attributing what the Spirit of God is doing to a work of the devil or totally discarding it. If you go to suck your last breath of oxygen and you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, you haven't received the conviction or the convincing by the Spirit of God in his ministry, that becomes an unpardonable, irrevocable sin. You just die without Christ. And there is no, there is no, and nothing else for that. So only a non-believer can commit that. But we took up another aspect for the believer, and that is even though you're born again, you can actually commit what is called a sin onto death. And a believer, uh, whether you understand it or not, can uh, accumulate a sin in their life by non non-repentance, not dealing with stuff, and they can actually exit life earlier than intended. So we brought this up, this is the second in this particular aspect of the sin unto death. We did the a couple, four weeks, I think, on the unpardonable sin prior to this. But here we talked about, uh, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof you will surely die. This is what God told Adam back in the book of Genesis. And we took up the word surely die, which is the word die, die. 
And we took it up that it was spiritual and physical. And then we talked about how that we as believers, uh, we deal with that spiritual aspect, that first part of surely. Th that word die, because it's the same word. That spiritual aspect. Our spiritual aspect of our makeup is sealed. It's done. Uh, the Spirit of God came and regenerated our newborn spirit and sealed us with the Spirit of God until the day we meet Jesus face to face. However, although our flesh has been paid for too, we have not yet picked up our redeemed, paid for new body. We haven't had it yet. It hasn't been given to us yet. And so we're living in this older one, this one that we got from Adam, and it's, it is subject to certain conditions, like there's sin working in its members, but in the new birth experience, we have the power to say no to it. We have the power to keep it in check. And we're required to keep it in check, even as a believer. And so although we're born again of the Spirit of God, we're living in a body that has not yet fully experienced its redemption, and therefore we've got to keep it in line so that we can fulfill God's plan for our life. And he describes it this way. When we are walking according to our new birth experience, we're called walking in the Spirit, or by our newborn spirit. And when we're not listening to and adhering to our newborn spirit and the principles of this new life in Christ, we are then, we gravitate back to who we were and what we were in Adam in our physical, and we walk in the flesh. And so you can be a, a, a believer and have access to two arenas. You can walk in the spirit or you can walk in the flesh. The thing about it is if you walk in the spirit, according to the word of God, you can add years to your life and live life uh, victoriously and reign in life, by the way. Or you can also, even as a believer, not renew your mind, not apply the Word of God to your, new, to your life now that you are, are born again. And you can just live as miserable a life, in fact, a more miserable life, than the people in the world. I reckon that, that the Christians live a more miserable life. I, let me put it this way. Uh, Christians that walk in the flesh are more miserable than unbelievers who never got born again. Christians who have made Jesus Lord of the life and continue to walk in the flesh are more miserable than people out there that didn't know about it in the first place. Because the problem is you know about it and you've got a voice on the inside that tells you all the time you're wrong and you know that you're wrong. However, uh, believers do it. So we talked about this over in 1 Corinthians 6.19. What Paul says? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. And then he goes on to explain what that means. It says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, and now he tells you, glorify God in your body. Even though your body is still has an Adamic laws working in it, he says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So yes, you're born again. Yes, you've been redeemed. But you've redeemed spiritually and physically. You say, well, I haven't experienced that physical change yet. Nonetheless, until that change comes, you can still bring your body into line. Yes, sir? Absolutely. Uh, some people are thinking that we are, we're here to change. Well, the reality is we, we, we're not here to change. We've actually been exchanged. Now we've got to live out of the exchange, not try to change. And it's just a different optic. It's much easier to live out of a life you believe you have than to try and create a life that you're not convinced is there yet. And so I, 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 I use that terminology. Uh, we don't live a changed life. We live an exchanged life. It's just a different optic. And so your body and your spirit belong to God. And you've got to bring your body into line. In Romans 8, 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. He's talking to believers. For if you live after the flesh, you'll die. You say, well, you know, I go to church every week. I read the Bible all the time. And I say, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus. I mean, it's all in my vernacular. Well, you can say whatever you want, but here's the deal. If you live after the flesh and you're mean and stingy and you're envious and you're unforgiving and you're a thief and you're blah, 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 and you can run down the line because, you know, believers can sin just as good as unbelievers. Don't kid yourself. And if you decide even as a believer that you want to continue to live after your flesh and not try to conform to 
the new image that is in you, not try to be a doer of the word and, and just continue and think, well, I can just continue in this because, you know, I got my ticket out of here and everything will be rosy, everything will be fine. He says, no, let me tell you, don't be deceived. If you live after the flesh, you're going to die. And then he goes on to say, but if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you live. And we brought up about adding years to your life. And, and I, I took this up last, last week. Galatians 6, 7. Paul says to the Galatian church, don't be deceived. Christians, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. This is not some game where you join God and you get a ticket out of here and you say, there you are. I've got, I, I pulled the wool over God's eyes. I went and got my ticket. I made Jesus the Lord of my life. And now I'm going to go off out now and sin like the Dickens. And it doesn't matter what happens to me. When I take my last breath, I'm going to heaven. And... You know, I got one over on God. He said, don't be so stupid. He says, if you genuinely made Jesus the Lord of your life, that, that's true and that's fine and that's sealed. But here's the deal. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. If, if you sow to your flesh, you will of the flesh. If you sow to your flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. Not of your spirit, of your flesh as a believer. If you sow to your flesh, you will exit earlier than you intended. It says, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Brought this up last week then too. Longevity is in our hands, not God's. It's in our hands, it's not God's. And we talked about how that our life is not like these little you know, paddle boats that are right on the, on the pond, and you know you hire it for so many hours and when he looks at the, the 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 book and he sees that you've been out too long he gets a loud hailer and he shouts number 24 your time is up and you got to paddle back to the to the side that's not what god's doing with us in life we're not sitting here today wondering is god going to call our number god's not calling our numbers God has given us life and it's down to us with our own free will as to how far we extend it out or how short we make it and a lot, of that, a lot of that's got to do with the exercise of, of health and, and diet and rest and worry and stress and all of these things that we are designed and not designed to do. And, and, and depending on how we treat ourselves physically in particular will determine uh, the, the quality of life that we live. And so we brought this up as we closed last week. My son, forget not my law. Let thine heart keep your, my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace, they shall add to thee. We took up scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 4 last week and Deuteronomy chapter 6 as well, also over in Ephesians chapter 6, where uh, God speaking to the children of Israel told them if they would obey the word of God, if they would obey the commandments, that God would give them longevity. Longevity. He told them, he says, you keep the word, keep the commands, and I will extend your life. It'll, it'll, it'll extend your life just by doing what the word says. And likewise here, Solomon says the same. If you will forget not the law of God, and keep, uh, uh, but uh, let your heart keep my commandments, length of days, long life and peace. And the word there, peace, is tranquility on all your borders. And all your, relationally, maritally, socially, financially, Morally, every arena of your life will have calm, peace. So he says here, length of days, long life, and peace, they shall add to thee. He goes on uh, in the same discourse here, and he gets down to this part. Happy is the man that finds wisdom, the man that gets understanding. For the value or the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She, and I, I said this as closing last week, wisdom in the word of God is always described in the female gender. And the reason for it is the lightning to wisdom and us is like a man in the pursuit of a, a woman that he falls in love with. Uh, and you often, you know yourself, uh, those of you who are married, how that, you know, of all the people you met in life and through life and all the other ladies that you met, and then one day that lady walked past and caught your attention. And, but so much so that, you know, you just wanted to drop everything else and, and go in the pursuit. I grew up with a couple of lads. We were in the army together and we drank together and we were always together. I mean, we were together from we were that height. And, 
uh, we just piled around right up into our early 20s and we did everything. I mean, goodness me, we were everywhere and did everything. And we sort of always did it together, a few of us, but two, two of us in particular. Uh, and I remember the night standing in a, in, in a, in a bar in Ireland uh, and this little blonde thing walked in. Uh, five feet, if she was five feet one inch, that was the height of it. And of all the experiences we had in life and all the loyalties that we have one with another and we were dedicated, we were the best of friends. I remember the night she walked in and walked past and got his attention. The following week he wasn't standing in the same place where we were at the same bar buying the same pints at the same time we were. No, he was sitting in some little nook down here in the same bar, sitting talking to her and we, we saw less and less and less and less of him and before you know it, he didn't give two fiddlers about us. He had found something else to pursue. And he married her and he's still married to her to the end. They're happily married. And, and, but you say, well, after all these years of palling around together and all the loyalties that we had as friends, and now she came along and that was it. He went after her and that was it. And he was right to as well. And we all do that. He says, wisdom's the same. When you see her, you should go after her. When you see her, you should do everything you can to gain her. So he goes on here, he says, she is more precious than rubies, and all things that you can desire are not to be compared to her. Length of days are in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. And we brought this out last week in closing, and that was that in the right hand is the predominant hand in the word of God. And the right hand here is length of days. The left hand, which is not the predominant hand, has riches and honor. Yet it's amazing in life how many of us go after the left hand and, and not the right hand. But you know what? The left hand's no good to you if the right hand's not loaded properly. And then the other thing is this. Why would you go after a right hand or a left hand when you can go and embrace her yourself? And this is basically what he's saying. Go after wisdom, not what she has in her hands. Go after God, not what God can do for you or not what God can give to you. Because it's amazing how many people come to God looking for what he has in the right hand or particularly what he has in the left hand. They come to God wondering what the word of God can do for me, get for me, achieve for me, accomplish for me or bring me. And, and he says, you know what? You're running after wisdom for the wrong reason. You've got to go after her. If you get her, you'll get both her hands. Don't you know that? If you fall in love with her and love her for all the right reasons, you get everything she's got. And so that's what he's saying here. And here's what she's got. She's got length of days in her right hand. So you get a hold of wisdom, you hold on to her, you pursue her, you fall in love with her, and the benefit of having her in your life is longevity of days. It says here in Proverbs 4 and 10, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life shall be many. Well, flip it over, because you know, the, these proverbs go one way or the other. I mean, it's, you're making a statement, but that statement makes another statement, although it's unsaid. Hear, O oh my son, and receive my sayings. Well, if you receive his sayings, the years of your life shall be many. The flip side of that is if you don't listen, then it won't be as long, or may not be as long. But again, he's just sort of telling you, the word of God will help add years to your life. In Proverbs 9 and 10, it says, Fear the Lord, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. That's the smartest thing you can ever do, is start to reverence. The word there, fear, is the word reverence, God. To reverence a, a, a God is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me, this is wisdom again, by me your days shall be multiplied. I think it's wonderful. You multiply your days. He says, I'll multiply your days and the years of your life shall be increased. I mean, that's exactly what he said. He said, if you will put the word of God, start doing what the word of God says in your life, start believing the word of God and, and, and again, by wisdom, correctly applying it, it'll, it'll multiply your days. You say, well, God's just going to, God's got a number. God knows the day. God called them home. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. We, we, we exit uh, ourselves. We exit over time based on the life that we live and the, the manner of life in which we live. And, and adding the word of God to our life increases 
our days and adds to the quality of the life that we live. So we're not out there this morning. None of us are going off to work this morning and waiting for our number to get called. Um, does God know when our, when our days are up? Yes, he does. He's omnipotent. He knows all things. However, you and I can add to or reduce life. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, uh, uh, Ephesians 6, 1 says. Yes, sir. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one came to be. I'm yeah, my brother brought that up last week. And I'm not smart enough to remember everything that was said last week. All right. So, where, how is that not contradictory again? It's not contradictory. Yeah, anything... When you grab one particular verse in any instance, you can't make a doctrine out of a verse. Um, there, yeah, there's got to be a consistent. That's why the Bible says you rightly divide the word uh, and you interpret scripture with scripture. So if you read that one verse of scripture and you don't read anything else, then you automatically think, well, God has your days numbered. Or you can also read that God knows the number of your days. And God should because God is omnipotent and he knows. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And here's the thing about God's purpose for your life. Here's the, here's the difference. Um, here's the difference with God's purpose for your life. And that is this. It's not God's will that any should perish. That all would come to repentance. So what happens to the ones who perish? I have a scripture that says it's not God's will for any to perish. The Bible says it's God's will that all come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, we know what the will of God is for everybody's life, and that is that they won't perish and they'll all come to the truth. So what happens to the ones that don't come to the truth and perish? You say, well, I, I, it says there, God, it's God's will. That's the will of God, that they will not. Well, God numbers our days and, and sets out days. I mean, he has plans for our life. He has a purpose for all of our life. But did you know that you may never fulfill the purpose that God has for your life? You may never uh, yield to the will of God and, and get saved and you may well perish. But it's not that it's not God's will. It's not that it's not God's plan. God has plans for all of us. And sometimes what we, when we read verses like that, and maybe just one verse, we would read that and think that's the sovereignty of God. God has our days numbered, so when, you know, your 28,234th day comes, God says, oh, there, your time's up. The meter runs out, and because that's the number of days. Well, let me ask you this. If God, and being consistent with the Word of God, if God is no respecter of persons, and, and He treats us all the same, why do some people's numbers are more than others? Why would God give you more numbers than me? That's not fair. I wish I got more numbers than you. I wish I got more years. Why would you shorten my years? Why would you only give me 20 years and give somebody else 30 years? Well, what's the big deal? I mean, it, it, you, you don't favor one over another. You treat us all the same. You love all of us. So why would you do such a thing? So it's not that he's saying God has his particular day. He's just saying God has our days numbered. He knows the number of our days. But... Uh, because he's God. But as to the length of that or the, uh, the, the shortness of that, that, that's down to us. As to whether we fulfill the will of God or don't fulfill the will of God, that's not up to God, that's up to us. Whether we fulfill the purpose God has for our life or not fulfill the purpose God has for our life, that's up to us. Whether we get saved or don't get saved, that's up to us. So that one particular verse, and it does say he numbers our days, uh, 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 and he uh, uh, Moses says also in Psalm 90, uh, Lord, teach us to number our days. Um, and again, respectfully, Moses was saying, Lord, help us to make every day count. So I don't think he's, he has a number there. I think he's just saying he understands and is aware of the numbers of the days that we have. But he didn't pick them um, for us. He just knows them as he was making us. He knew. Uh, he knows some people will come and some people won't. He knows some people will get saved and some people won't. But for the ones who will, he carries on with the process and makes everybody. Because he knows you know, some will, some won't. But it'll be their choice. Yes, Barry. Just observation. I mean, my life, I've struggled with even caring about a long life. Um, we lived as Christ and died in being. Yeah. Check it out right now. I'm just fine. You know? And one day standing in the shower as I was that I mean, kind of got 
God spoke to me and, and said to me, "Why are you so selfish?" And and as I thought about that, um, I realized we all do have a purpose. And length of life for me was not just to enjoy. It was, well, that's part of it, but more. How can I impact with length of life? Like, how can I impact more people for Christ um, in that time? You know, and that's really the point of yeah. it. And it, it just dawned on me. You know, um, that's why I don't want to check out early. That's why I, I would like to extend the days so I have more opportunity. And then, if, if I think also of, of you know God's equation and His economy, you know that. You know, we're storing up treasures in heaven. That that's another reason, you know, for for length of life and wanting that. Mm -hmm. and that. Just the, I, for a lot of people, uh, and it's a series I'll do. Um, I don't know if I'll do it in the morning and see what you guys, but I, I'll certainly do it in, in, in the not too distant future. I want to do a series on purpose. Um, you know, so many people live life without ever discovering their purpose. And there's nothing worse in life, nothing worse in life than to have been successful at the wrong assignment. To have lived your whole life out doing something that wasn't what God asked you to do. What a waste of a life, what a waste of time. And a lot of times we've got skill sets and gifts that God gives to us for the purpose that he actually had for us. And we discover them because we we're good at this, and we're great at that, and we're brilliant at this. But God had originally put them in us to fulfill the purpose that he had for us. And we spend a lot of our life never giving our lives to God or finding the purpose of God for our life. And so we spend our life being successful because we've got gifts and graces, but at the wrong assignment. And that's a sad thing. Especially when you grow older and you've done everything, and achieved everything, and then you look at your life and think, what a waste because I'm not happy. It's not what fulfills me. And so there are many questions that people ask. The most important question that anyone should ask, and we don't ask it. And, you know, you can tell me where you got saved, how you got saved, when you got saved. Did I say where? Where? When? How? And, and, and answer all them questions. So when did you get saved? Oh, I got saved such a... How did you get saved? Oh, I got saved. Uh, and where did you get saved? But the real question is, why did you get saved? Why? Why did Jesus do what he did for you? Well, to go to heaven. Was it to go to heaven? Adam didn't fall from he heaven. Adam fell from earth. Why did Jesus do what he did? Why? You've got to ask why. We don't ask why anymore. Why will cause you to find your purpose? Why? Why do you exist? Why are you sucking oxygen on the planet in this generation? Well, you'll never know your purpose until you go. The purpose of a thing always lies in the, in the mind of the one who created it. That's the only place you can find purpose. Don't ask me for your purpose. I can't ask you, I can't tell you your purpose because purpose lies in the mind of the one who created it. So everything around has a purpose. I'm talking about purpose now. Everything around us has a purpose. Um, but if you want to know the purpose of a thing, you go back to the creator of it and you ask the creator of it, what was the purpose of it? The purpose for my life and your life doesn't lie with me or you, it lies with God. And you'll never know who you are and what you were meant to be or do until you reconnect with God. That's when you find your purpose. Anyway, that's another series for another time. So, Ecclesiastes 8.11. Here's where they read wrong. It, it said there, Because the sentence against evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, or it seems like, Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, uh, with them that uh, fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days. So he says, you know, there, there's a price to pay for living away from God, or for living the wild life. He, he just says, there's, if there's a penalty. You sow to your flesh, you will reap a corruption from it. He says in Psalm 55 and verse 23, But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. 
bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. He says here, you know what? If you want to live that life, if you want to live that sort of a life, he says, bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half of their days. They'll die early. You know, I'm a professional bungee jumper. <laughs> By all means, do it. But I wouldn't want to be called to it. Yes, sir? Is that to be read literally? Or is there any figurative element to that where it's like you're not truly living a full life if you're not walking in the ways of, of, of God? Or, or is it a literal statement to that degree? Or the bloody and deceitful man should live yeah. out half their lives. No, I think what he's trying to get at is there's, a, there's choices of lifestyles. Um, you want to live a life, you know, Jesus made the statement, he who lives by the sword will die by it, so to speak. And, um, you know, if you want to live that life, you want to live on the edge. You say, well, I live it. I mean, I, I want to be one of these guys that flies that suit. I don't know if you ever see them, they go up and they put this, zip up this suit and then they jump off a mountain and they, and they, they I mean, if you want to live on the edge, I mean, that's a choice of lifestyle. You just go and look at the numbers of how many die from it every year, or those who want to climb Everest and just say they stood on the top of a freezing cold mountain at 29,204 know, feet and you know, got a photograph, that's fine. If you want to live on that edge, you can. He says, but, you know, uh, th these are lifestyle choices. Uh, and bloody and deceitful men shall, you know, they're living on the edge all the time. And uh, if, if they slip off, uh, there are some things you can recover yourself from. Um, one of those skydivings one of the, is probably one of the ones you can't. Uh, once you jump out, you're waiting on that parachute to open. If it don't open, you're in trouble. That's it. I mean, you've just made the one mistake. You only have to make that mistake how many times? Once. Once. That's it. Um, and if you want to live on that edge, and trust that every time you jump out, you'll get it right. That's fine, but many don't. And he says, you just choose your lifestyle right. Choose the Word of God. Choose God's lifestyle for you. And, and, and he's got health and wealth and all of those things keyed into it. Jeremiah seventeen eleven, As the partridge sitteth on the eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches, but not the right way. He shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. Uh, the partridge lays the eggs and, and, and leaves it for another to, to, to brew them, never gets the chance because they, they, they're, they're, uh, they make their nests on the, on the ground. Uh, and they've all the intentions of, of bringing out a brood, but many times they never get to bring it to the full fruition because of where they nest. And likewise, he says, you know, we, we can do a lot of things ourselves and think that we have plans as what's going to happen. I've planned for 10 years and 20 years, but you have no idea if the issues of life will scare you off your, your future. And before you know it, you never even see it because um, you just never get to see out your plans. You never get to bring to fruition the thing that you are planning to birth. It, sometimes for wicked people, it just doesn't happen. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. It's just life, lifestyle choices. You know, let me just say this, and I'll, I'll throw it in for, you know, a lot of times we are out there condemning everybody for certain sins and different things, and uh, sometimes the church can get very haughty in its, in its elevated position of righteousness to judge other people in, in lifestyles, particularly when they, they, they get born again, then everybody wants them to change overnight and whatever. Let me just say, lifestyles bring certain fruitions. Um, and, you know, you can be a born-again believer and smoke like a train if you want. Does God hate you anymore? No. Uh, uh, does God uh, have any less plans or purpose for your life? Nope. Uh, does God think any less? Nope. But you can die early. Uh, I mean, they even put a, a, a notice on the side of the box that says smoking will cause cancer. But you're quite entitled as a believer to go do that. And if you want to live the lifestyle, that's choice. You can go drink or you can go, you know, live different types of lifestyles, even as a believer. And, you know, uh, 
God doesn't love you any less, but you are in control of the life and whether you add or shorten the years of it. You gonna ask me something? Uh, so smoking, that wouldn't be considered a sin though. Say what? That's just a lifestyle, right? Yeah, just a lifestyle. But, but we have lifestyle choices. And you know, as, as we brought up there a moment ago about, you know, is that literal? Well, no, he's just talking about lifestyle choices. And even as a believer, you can just not choose the right lifestyle as a believer. But, but the thing is, we can. We have the power to. And this is what a sin unto death is going to accumulate with. Not taking control of our lifestyle as a believer and continuing in sin. Ecclesiastes says, Be not over uh, uh, much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest you die before your time? I mean, have common sense. I mean, God give us common sense. You know, a lot of times people, uh, I, I had somebody recently, we were talking and they, they wanted to pray about everything that they'd done. Uh, everything. I mean, we'd met, they just, and, and you know, the truth is, you don't have to pray about everything that you do. Uh, God give you common sense. Um, you look right and look left before you cross the road. You don't have to pray in the Holy Ghost and then just say, oh, well, I'm going to step out, hope the traffic will stop. You, you go to the red lights and you press the button and you walk across the road. Or, you know, you, God give us common sense. You don't have to pray about everything. Uh, so, you know, just don't live a wicked life. Don't live a foolish life. Just use common sense and walk with God and it, it, he'll lead you in the, in the right path. So, sin on to death. Let me get over here and talk about this. In 1 John 5, this is where we get this doctrine from. If any man see his brother, now who are we talking about here? Unbelievers or believers? believers. These are believers. 1 John is written to believers. This is all to us. Okay, it's all about us. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not on to death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not on to death. In other words, you can intercede for. You can speak to God on behalf of others. Maybe you see a brother that's in difficulty with a certain issue or a problem or, or something, and, and you can certainly talk to God and, and, and intercede on their behalf and, and, and get involved in their life to some degree as God leads or directs. And you can help them along the road and help them out of the issues, situations, or circumstances that they find themselves in. If a man see his brother sin a sin, which is not on to death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not on to death. There is a sin on to death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not on to death. So, Different um, interpretations of this uh, come up. For example, uh, some of the commentators would have said uh, this sin unto death was, for example, let's say somebody uh, was convicted of a crime that was the death penalty, and it was a heinous crime. It was horrific, and the the civil law of the land that you live in and the moral value of the people you live among said that particular crime deserves the death penalty. Well, if that's the way it is and that's what they've done, don't ask God to help them escape uh, or help them get free because they've done something, they've violated, they've committed a crime that in, in their, in their uh, community and in their generation is worthy of, of death, so to speak. And so we, some of the commentators say, this is the sin unto death. If somebody has sinned a sin that is condemned by the society or the people or the generation of which they live among, don't be praying for it because it, God's not going to intervene. Uh, you know, somebody who murdered kids or did such and such, a, don't ask God because God's not going to get involved. The guy did something, he got stepped overboard, he stepped across the line, he did something, and that's the penalty. What If you sow to your flesh, you reap corruption. Don't ask me about it. But there are menial sins that people do, and you can talk to God about it and help them out of it. That, that's what some say. But I think scriptures, because you've got to interpret this particular verse with other scriptures, I think there's more to it than, than that. Um, 
for example, uh, it says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. it says, this is the communion table. It says, let a man examine who? Himself. Himself. Okay. The communion table is about what? Himself. Examining yourself. That's what the communion table is for. We, 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 we don't understand that. We think, you know, when we have communion, we just break bread. The whole purpose of the, of the moment, of the time, is for you to stop and look at yourself. Examine yourself. How am I doing? How, how, how's life going for me at the moment? How are things? So why would I examine myself at this point? Because we're going to remember what God did for us, what Jesus did for us. So when we come to the communion table, it's a self-examination. How am I doing? How is my walk with you? How is my productivity, my life, my health? How am I doing? Now that I've done that, as I take these emblems, as I take bread, it reminds me of What about it? For what? For what? Was his body broken for your sin? Yes. Physical life, healing, well-being, prosperity, favor, joy, uh, all of the physical things. His body was broken. All the consequences of sin in his natural life. He says he's, his body, he, that was a part, he, it was an addition. He, he only had to shed blood to, to pacify God's wrath on sin. That, if, you've done, if you've done our Saturday morning, you'll understand what I'm talking about. The, 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 the breaking of the body of Christ was for all my physical ailments. So as I examine myself and I take this bread, I'm examining myself, my life, my, my physiology and, and its advancement in this natural life, aware of what was done for me so that I might have an abundant life. So I'm measuring. How good am I doing in comparison to what you did for me? In comparison to what you paid for, for me, how am I doing? Have I picked up everything that you've you done for me? Am I enjoying all the benefits of what you've done for me? No, I don't think so. Okay. But that's what that's for. And then when I take up the cup, what's that to do? When I, I assume you have communion, so what's the cup for? Pardon? In what sense? Yeah. And go deeper than that? Yeah, th there is. But again, and this is why optics are very important. When you talk about blood in the world, who's the one who brought up all this blood issue? God. God, God has nothing but bloody covenants. Every time God sets a... Who started covenants, by the way? Covenant. God did. A covenant is a God thing. Okay? It's a blood thing. And the thing about a covenant that's signed in blood is that there is no going back on it. All in. All in. Everything. Every single thing. That cup that we share is to remind us we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, Paul said. Do you remember that portion of scripture in the communion? Let's turn over there just for a minute. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, please. He's all with me. 
When you take the communion, the whole purpose of the communion table is to examine ourselves. And our examination is to see how are we doing in light of what has been done for us. That's all. I, I, have we got it all? Are we enjoying it all? Um, does somebody want to read? Uh, and again, Paul was instructed to do this by the Lord Jesus. In verse 23, does somebody want to read the first down to verse uh, 26, please? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you declare, you uh, uh, decree, you affirm the Lord's death until he comes back. So what about the Lord's death are we affirming, uh, declaring, proclaiming, decreeing? What about his death are we are we shouting about? That he made for our past, present, and future sins. Uh huh. Anything else? What does that mean? I mean, if he paid for our past, present, and future, uh, when we take up, again, it, he says, do this in remembrance. Uh, take, eat, and break, uh, it's broken for you in remembrance. It's a remembrance service. Uh, why do you need to remember something, by the way? Yeah? Well, why do you need to remember something? I mean, the logical answer to that is you need to remember something in case you forget. Because here's the deal. Even if you have something, but you forget that you have it, you might, might as well not have it in the first place. If you've been given something that you've forgotten you already have, you might actually later on go looking for it and realize how many of you have ever done that? How many of you have ever bought a tool that you thought you didn't have only to find out you four of them in the toolbox? <laughs> so, my goodness, if I hadn't known I had that, I wouldn't have bought it. I forgot that I had it. Many times as believers, we go through life, and life causes us to forget what we already have. And we go through things, and we just think it's the status quo, que sera, sera, everybody's getting it, everybody has it, everybody's doing it. You say, oh, hold on, you've forgotten something. You've forgotten something. You're a believer. Oh yeah, but everybody, I mean, it's going around now, it's, it's, uh, it's for all. Yeah, but hold on a second, before you, before you just jump in with everybody else, remember something. You have a covenant with somebody and it costs them something. And every time you have communion, you actually bring to remembrance that covenant. And in remembering that covenant, you are again proclaiming and declaring and decreeing and affirming what was done for me. You with me? And then he carries on with his explanation. Somebody want to read verses 27 and 28? It says here, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord, not unworthily or in an unworthy or in an unworthy fashion. What he's basically saying is, if you take it up and have no regard for what it is you're doing, and don't understand what the very emblem, the, the emblems are there to do what? Remind us. Remind us, Remind us of what? The, the covenant that we have, the things he did for us physically, but the bread and the blood covenant that we have because of the blood of Jesus, we have a blood covenant with God now. And because of that, I stand in a different position in life than, than anybody else, if you understand what I'm saying, because I'm, I have this covenant with God. 
a physical and a spiritual covenant with God. But if I take the very two emblems that are supposed to remind me of what I have, and I treat them flippantly, like, oh, we do it every Sunday, so hey, here it comes, yep, bow the head, just let on for a wee minute, and then walk away. There you are, I had communion. No, you didn't. Communion is a solemn remembrance and an examination of your own self at that point. How well am I doing in light of the covenant that was paid for me? Am I enjoying what I have? Have I forgotten what was done for me? Have I forgotten that Jesus bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases and with his stripes I'm healed? Have I forgotten that when my enemy rises against me in one direction, he flees from me in seven and I'm worrying about everything that's going to happen when I go to work on Monday? He says, that's what it's for. But if you lift it up in an unworthy manner and forget the very reason of which the remembrance service is for, you're in trouble because the very thing that's to remind you of what you have, it, it's failing to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, given how many of us have uh, not been in church for a long time, uh -huh. for a lot of different reasons, uh, would it be appropriate to take communion here? Yes, we could. I'd love to do it with you. I, 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 break, I break bread myself. I do it for me. I don't need anybody else to do it. Lucy and I would have done it too many times. Just if we were doing something, maybe facing something, going through an issue in life, something with our kids or whatever, we have taken the emblems, just bread and, and, and orange juice, or it doesn't matter what it is. The power is not in, you know, in, in Catholicism, we talk, we, we call that doctrine transubstantiation, where we turn that thing into, a, a, there's nothing magical or mystical about the bread or the wine, nothing. It doesn't change. What changes is me in remembering what I have and what I do. And yes, breaking bread, and we've done it many a time, and I've done it many a time uh, uh, through life and still do it, when on, just on my own I will take emblems and spend time with God and examine myself when I just don't feel that I'm where I need to be or what I need to be doing, and, and will have that time with God, and I will sort of re rededicate myself to the covenant that has been given to me through Christ. Yes, sir? No, and I was the same. I was an altar boy, for goodness sake. I was giving them communion. So uh, I didn't know it either. But that's what it's there for. That's why God, Peter didn't come up. Paul was given this and told to go back and tell people to do this because there's a tendency to forget what was done for us. We are all caught up in the, in the Christian thing. You say, hey, hold on for a second. It's not about you know, the, the, the environment you go to on a Sunday. It's not about the, the, the music. It's not about the lights. It's not about the community. It's about you and God. How are you doing? How's your life going in the light of what has happened? How's your world around you? How, how's your health? How's your victories in life? Or are you being defeated right now? So he says, if you're going to eat and drink in an unworthily fashion, then you're negating the very emblems that were given to you to remember the thing. So this is what he's saying. Now let's read the rest of it. Somebody read verses 29 and 30. He said, for he that eateth and, well, verse 28 says, examine himself. And then he says, for he that, in 29, he that eateth and drinketh in an unworthy fashion, eats and drinks judgment on himself. How would you eat and drink judgment on yourself? By not discerning the Lord's table. That's, I mean, if, if you lift up these two emblems and you're, you've got symptoms and, and, and issues in life with, with business or relationally or whatever, and you're going through you know, the swamp of life 
and you're down and you're depressed and whatever and you lift up these two emblems on a Sunday morning and you have communion and you take one and you, you slosh it down to get rid of that thing that's stuck to the roof of your mouth and you think, and that's it, I'm great, I'm good. He said, not for a wonder when you walk out on Monday morning, you go straight back into the same hole you were in because you didn't remember anything. You didn't stand up on, 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 on faith and say, hold on a second. Jesus bore my sickness, carried my diseases, or I have a covenant with the Almighty God, and no matter what weapon the devil fashions against me, it is not going to prosper. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And tomorrow, I'll tell you what, this week's going to be a different week because God is with me, and if God be for me, who can be again? And here we go. This is faith now talking. But these emblems were to remind me of that. But he says, there are people who don't examine themselves, eat in an unworthy fashion, and as a result of it, there's a whole bunch of you sick, and in fact, some of you got so sick, you're dead. You've slept. Yes, sir. This reminds me, I guess, maybe he paints a picture of why Jesus used the word cup in Gethsemane when he was sweating blood and how he said, your will not mine be done with the cup pass. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, cup, a cup was something you had to partake of. You know, if I hand you a say, and, and say, here, here, and I pass you a cup, and you don't drink of it, you haven't partaken of it. When somebody hands you a cup, they ask you or invite you to participate. When you lift up the emblems, you're invited again or reminded again that your part in this, you didn't pay for it, but you get to participate in what it done. So when I, when I lift up the emblems on, whenever that is, it doesn't have to be on a Sunday. We can do it at home. You can do it with your wife and kids. We can do it here. We might even do it next week. But we, we have communion. But absolutely, we just lift it up and we remember, we examine ourselves, and, and then we make the adjustments that are necessary. And he says, because people don't do this right, many are sick. And in fact, many have died. And yet they were holding up these two emblems in their hands on a regular basis, and they were looking past it religiously and not examining themselves and bringing themselves back into line and participating with the covenant that was won for them. Yes? Isn't this like a, like a really huge thing? Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking even our own church and so many churches I've been a part of, I mean, we never discuss any of this. You know, and, and it's, if, if what Paul, what he's saying here is that Many of you are sick because of. I mean, isn't the opposite also true? If you do this, then it can provide healing and health and all that. So, I mean, isn't that like, that's a huge, big deal. Absolutely. Right? And this idea of judging yourself and being introspective and seeing clearly who you are. And the thing, you know, it, so, in other words, um, sometimes I think we go to church so we can, it's like a fix me club. You know, it's like another self-help book we go, you know, and, or we're, we're in counseling for, you know, two decades to try to get over something or whatever it might be, you know. But it's like there's a, there's like a prescription here if we, if we handle this correctly. Mm -hmm. In that moment, it provides all of this stuff for us. And I think we, we just miss the significance of this time. Is that true? That's exactly true. It's huge. And I love the terminology you use, prescription. I guarantee if any of you went to the doctor today and they walked in and said, take two of them and four of them and you know, rub your belly this way and rub the top of your head that way, you turn around and say, well, the doctor said, and if I do that, it'll work. And we take our prescriptions, and rightly so. I mean, these people are, you know, understand what it is, and we've submitted ourselves to their counsel for their prescription. Well, when you come to God, submit yourself to the prescription. Remember who you are, what you have, what was paid for, and as you rightly said, participate in the cup. Drink from it. And, and stand up and, and, and put your shoulders back and your head up and, and straighten yourself up and fix yourself. And don't think that you can walk out of here today and carry on doing what you were doing last week and think that the circumstances are, will change. Fix yourself in the light of these emblems and the covenant that you have and, and march on in faith. Let me wind this down because you've got to go to work, I know. Yes, sir. I get that it's a 
it's a solemn moment. Yes, sir. But shouldn't there also be an element of joy associated with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we always, one of the things about the cross, let me just say this too in winding this down. As believers, we spend so much time around the cross. We're, we're always around the cross. Oh, I've got to go back to the cross, you've got to go back to the cross. The cross is a constant remembrance of your sin and my sin. And it makes us sin conscious. Now I understand that we have to appreciate what was done there and why it was done there, whatever. But we need to be resurrection conscious more than we are cross conscious. And we spend most of our time around the cross, so every time we come to the blood, we go, because we're all supposed to be, and you know why we're sad? Because it reminds us of what we wear. Every time you put a crucifix around your neck, it reminds you of what you wear. You were a sinner. But he's not on a cross. He's risen. And yes, there should be an element of joy to it too, absolutely. If I could get to verse 31. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get to it. Yeah, no, no. That, no, no so, see, so why don't you go ahead and read, why don't you go ahead and read verse 31 and verse 32. So he's basically saying, when you come and you come for the right reason and do it the way it's supposed to be done, God deals with us. Hey, stop it. You're out there doing this week in, week out, and you're wondering why all your world around you is falling apart. Or you think you can watch this or do that or steal this or then, 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 and you think, hey, you're so used to doing it now. And then you wonder why you have these ailments or you wonder why you don't have favor in some arenas. And every time, if you really would seek to find out, it'll come up because you know in yourself you're doing something wrong. God brings it up. The Spirit of God reminds you of it. And you go, yeah, but I mean, that's, you know, I've got to go to work tomorrow and that's what we do and that's what it is. And I'm willing to give up all this other stuff, but I don't want to give up that part of my fleshly enjoyment. He said, well, that's the very reason that you're having the product that you're having. You've got to fix yourself. Repent. First John 1 and 9, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you. And this is a sin unto death. These people in Corinth were not breaking these emblems with the right understanding. And as a result of that, and the accumulation of that over time, they were sinning, doing this wrong, and they were dying because of it. Does that make sense? There's only one of several, but this was a bunch of people that were dying because they were doing something God told them to, to do and they weren't doing it right. Everybody okay? And, and Yes, sir. It just seems like this, the previous one that you talked about, our failure to examine ourselves and really reflect and, and look honestly at who we are, that singular failing Sometimes, though. The devil comes to buy and see and destroy. Yeah. And so we're tempted to not look at ourselves, blame others. Yeah. Sometimes the very thing we judge the most is the things we're doing ourselves. Right. I, I've, I've watched people over the years, I've counseled people over the years, and the thing that they came out against the most was the things they were dealing with the most. They were just conscious of it all the time, and they weren't dealing with it. So they saw it in everybody else. 
but they didn't see it in themselves. And, and that's another issue for another day.